My name is Eric Wessoff. I'm the editor-in-chief of Green Tech Media. Um, does anybody know of that publication? Raise your hand. All right. Good answer. Good answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before I was employee number one at Green Tech Media, I helped found a couple of companies. Um, one crashed and burned, one got sold to JDSU, and one is Green Tech Media, which is the company I currently work for. Um, and unlike many other Green Tech companies, we are a profitable company. Um, so I've seen venture capital from both the fundraising and as a, a reporter and an editor, I've seen venture capital, well, it's my job to sort of observe these folks in the wild. And um, I've, I've spent 10 years watching Green Tech Venture Capital, and I, I used to actually log every deal and total every deal. And so when I used to be able to present the numbers from, in, in, for example, in 2005, there was $820 million invested in 74 deals in the United States in Green Tech. Um, that number, $820 million, eventually grew to about $9 billion couple of years ago, uh, with more than 500 deals per year. Come in, you're late, here. Okay. Um, and that number has dropped significantly. So uh, the venture capital asset class is about 25, 20 to 25 billion dollars. And in 2013, only a few percentage points of that 20 billion dollars, 25 billion dollars is going to go to green tech. Um, that's really the numbers I wanted to present. We're, we're in sort of a, a cusp where we're, the old style venture capital doesn't work. Um, and we have three v venture v uh, VCs who have funds that are a little different than your standard venture capital fund. If you went to, a, I, 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 I'm allowed to name names, if you looked at a NEA, New Enterprise Associates, and you looked at their clean tech portfolio, you'd see 50 or 60 companies across the board, ranging from solar to biofuels, but to even more esoteric things like soy protein meat substitutes and a, a, a variety of stuff that they may or may not have expertise in. It, it turns out that the last 10 years of venture capital in clean tech hasn't worked extremely well with the exception of Tesla, Solar City, Enphase, and a few others that I think our panelists will be able to mention. Um, I think what we'd like to talk about here is what has been the arc of venture capital over the last decade and what's going to be able to be different over the next couple of years that will allow clean tech entrepreneurs to raise money. Um, it's, an, it, it's never easy to raise money, but it, if you went to a venture fund today and said you wanted to start a thin film uh, solar company, I think you would be you see the amusement. You would be laughed out of the office, probably. Um, the, the, it's not as if there's something wrong with thin film. It's just these VCs have the scars and the battle scars to show from, from the last 10 years. So each of these investors and each of these funds have, has a little bit of a different slant on venture capital compared to traditionalists. And, and Sean, I'd like you to, do you want to come up here? Do you want to stay where you are? Stay where you are. Stay where you are. Okay. Stay where you are. Uh, tell us about your fund, and in three minutes or less, and 100 words or less, tell me what just happened in the last 10 years in green tech and how we got to this less than enviable situation that we're currently in. In 100 words? Yep. Okay. Uh, first of all, our fund, uh, Clean Pacific Ventures, is a early, an early stage uh, clean tech, pure play focused fund. Uh, we uh, formed in 2005. And um, we're in a pleasure, well, actually the first fund is now, the investment period's closed, we're, we're raising money for the second fund. But um, we're interested in capital efficient, technology commercialization ready companies, um, which is very difficult to do. Uh, we're kind of, we, we say we look for unicorns and it's a very much a rifle shot uh, strategy. We've invested in nine companies from uh, March of 2007 until uh, February of this year in that portfolio, and we'll begin on the next portfolio this fall. Um, of those nine, we've sold one. We one was a zero, and the rest are all p past the survival line. So we'll return some some money in some form. Uh, so we're very proud of that. In a hundred words or less, what's happened in the last ten years? Uh, we came in 
uh, in a period of very, very heavy investment by some very, very large firms into biofuels first and then uh, front end, what I, what I call front end solar uh, panel and panel production uh, second, se secondarily. And we actually didn't form our thesis around that or I should say around not doing that, but rather, uh, but, but it did come about that we saw those as being mistakes before they were generally recognized and formed a much different strategy. Um, so first, you the excitement, the cash flows come into the business. Uh, those companies have a very difficult time um, manufacturing and, and the biofuels has a myriad of problems. Uh, which some companies have come through and some have not, and then went through a heavy investment period. I think that will come to a fruition. I, we do have a few uh, examples of success in clean tech, but I think you'll see that in the monetiz monetization, there are, there are por por portfolio companies out there that will show their faces uh, in exits over the next couple of years that were investments made in that period. You've got to remember, there's a very long time horizon for, for early stage investments in particular. And you know, 10 years is, a, is, is about the average probably for, for getting out between eight and 10 years. But you, you classify yourself as an early stage investor and there aren't that many folks these days who will own up to that, is that? Kind of right. I, I I don't own up to it. I, I I wear it with pride on my flag. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Dave, um, we talked. You, you, the things the, the thing that makes you different is that you're a venture design studio. If you had to describe yourself in three words, tell us a little bit more about what what the heck um, <laughs> your 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 fund company does. And again, same question to you. What, what, what happened in the last 10 years? How did we get to this situation we're currently in? I'll do my best. Um, so Venture Design Studio, Green Start, what that means is that we are a design studio, but we also invest. So we don't work with companies that we, unless we invest in them. And, and typically how we invest is through design services. Um, what that means and what design means for us is, is not what most people think about design when they hear it. It's not the, be the beautification of something. It's not the creation of a logo. It's not the creation of a graphic. But instead, it's really the, the marriage of user experience, uh, brand design, and business model design. And when you combine all of those entities together, you can truly give a company a competitive advantage. And so what we try to do is to bring those value-added resources to our portfolio to help give them a better shot at success. And um, it's hard, it's tough, and it's costly. But at the end of the day, if you want to be a good investor, you've got to do a couple of things. One is you've got to be able to attract good entrepreneurs. And good entrepreneurs now understand that design is no longer a nice to have, but it is a must have. Um, and the second thing you got, got have to be able to do is to really help companies understand how important it is to create products and services that really are simple and intuitive and are products that, that companies can, or actually more importantly, customers can rave about. And then when you can do that and you couple that with a brand that cuts through the clutter and, and really differentiates a company from another, combine that with a business model that scales, you can give a company, uh, it can break through. It can All right, so we're gonna wanna to hear to... about specific examples, but, but not just yet. So again, give us your uh, bedtime story of what just happened since, 2000, since 2006 in venture capital. Well, I, I don't think there's been a lot of innovation. Um, and I think what is happening now is you're seeing and beginning to see a lot of innovation. To your point a little bit earlier, Eric, um, the innovation that you've seen in venture capital over the past 30 years is really limited to moving the carry interest from you know, 20 to 30 percent. I mean, that's it. Um, and now what you're seeing is companies like, like First Round Capital, uh, Google Ventures, um, our company actually bringing in real resources and assets that can give a company a competitive advantage because up until now, over the past 10 years, I think you've had venture capital be at odds with their customer, which is the, which is the, the, uh, the entrepreneur. So, so uh, Repeat that again. The VC at odds with the um, yeah right? at odds so? at odds. So? Well, because in in large well there are a lot of reasons, but one is that you'll see investments taking place, especially at the Series A, where the, the the venture firm is actually trying to invest based upon a percent ownership that they want versus actually giving the the firm the the amount of money that they need. And in large part, you're giving venture cap, you're giving entrepreneurs more money than they need. It's driving up valuations, and it's not working on behalf of it's not working for them. Number two is they're just giving them money. They're not bringing in value added resources that they truly truly, truly need. And so from that perspective, I think they're, they're at odds with their customer. Okay. All right. Um, Pedram. Hi. 
Um, Petra's with the Mayfield it. Fund. It's a hallowed Silicon Valley name. Um, but there's no green tech portfolio on your website, right? What's it called? Energy tech. Yay. Um, so tell us, so that makes you a little bit different than everybody puts out a green tech banner or a clean tech banner. Um, so tell us why, what went into th that thinking, why you didn't make 10 investments in thin film, solar, and ethanol, uh, bio-based bio ethanol. <laughs> sure. So I'm Pedro Mokri, and I'm uh, principal over at the Mayfield Fund. And as Eric mentioned, it's one of the, uh, the older venture capital firms in the Valley, um, established in 1969. We manage about $3 billion, and we are predominantly uh, consumer and IT investors. Um, I joined about five years ago. Well, I was actually still a student of Jim Sweeney's, um, so I was kind of wearing two hats at the same time, to help build out a practice at Mayfield. And the, the thing that we kind of realized right away was that there's this real overexcitement around the concept of clean tech or green tech, but it really missed the picture of what, um, what was truly investable from our perspective. And the thing that we thought was interesting was around applying IT um, and our understanding of IT and consumer uh, investments to the world of energy. So right off the bat, we called it energy tech. And to be honest with you, our, our initial slide deck that we put together back in 2008 um, is still the exact same thing that we have in terms of our thesis today. So from our perspective, we haven't really changed at all. Um, we haven't made that many investments, but we've been relatively fortunate. Um, in the five investments that we've made, we've had one acquisition, one IPO, and three um, thriving sort of private companies still. Um, I'm always on the hunt for interesting new technology, so it's not to say that you know, we're, we're only going to do one a year, except that we're just very surgical on the way that we look at the market and what we're looking for. Um, and, and you can kind of probably understand from the way that we're dressed, I'm sort of the, the old school <laughs> money manager <laughs> uniform. <laughs> um, but, um, but I'll just jump to your question, which you asked is sort of what has changed um, since, I guess, the past decade. Um, not a heck of a lot has changed in the world of energy. And you said, you said to me earlier, look, look at how is your life different? What, what, yeah. what changes has, has venture capital made? In, if, you, if, if you wanted to know what changes venture capital made in the world of IT, you look in your pocket, you, you, you look at you what plug your, your iPhone. You, right, you plug in yeah. your iPhone. But the ch changes that the world has made in green tech, VCs, I think there's, there's been a few incremental drive things. Drive a fancy, beautiful car, yeah. right? And a beautiful, fancy EV, right? Yeah, I think from, from, a, from a macro perspective, there's, there hasn't been a lot of change that's, that's happened. And that's why I think there's still a lot of opportunity. We're just at the very, very beginning. I think that's one of the reasons why we're all kind of sitting up here and talking about it still, in that I think the macro problems haven't been solved. I mean, the buildings aren't any smarter. You know, we're not fundamentally more efficient. EVs are not ubiquitous everywhere. Um, we're still kind of trying to figure out, you know, the, the mass charging issues. Um, renewables are still a tiny fraction of, of overall production. So there, there's still a long, long, long way to go. I think the thing that we have learned is that you can't necessarily bribe Mother Nature by signing a big check and, and hoping that you can solve material science problems quickly. Um, that is probably the biggest difference. And we never really uh, found that to be an interesting venture opportunity from our perspective. So the investments that we made, which we'll talk about a little bit later, were always around exactly what Dave was talking about, which I'm so glad that you know, his, his, uh, his, his company and his, and his fund started, um, because it's all about bringing products to people, right? Understanding what the consumers want and figuring out a way to deliver an energy-centric product, but package it in a way that they can actually understand and absorb into their daily lives and daily behaviors. Um, I'm going to, in a... a f and in an in, in instance of uh, blatant self-promotion, I have to um, mention that Green Tech Media is putting on an event um, called Next Wave Investing, trying to take a look at are there new strategies, are there new ways to look at venture capital. Um, and if you have any questions on that, please see me after, or after this program if you want to talk about uh, participating or attending that event. But. The, 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 in fact, the, the organizer of that event, a guy named Rob Day, who's a, or one of the organizers of that event, Rob Day, from, uh, who's a VC on, of the family office on the East Coast, said, why should I invest incredible amounts of capital in order to produce a commodity product, which is what has happened with companies like Mia Soleil, Nana Solar, Bloom Energy, uh, 
there's a long list who are putting in billions of dollars, but the product they have to produce at the end is a eight cents per kilowatt hour electron. Mm -hmm. And why should you go about doing that with a five billion dollar piece of material science that's going to take you 14 years? So yeah. the the event that we're putting on is trying to look at that and see if there's other ways of, of, of skinning that cat. So Pedram, tell me a company in your portfolio company, uh, in your portfolio, and why you invested in them. And you have an obvious choice. I know we wanted to not give you this choice. But go ahead. It's an, it's an important company and they're successful. So tell us about one of your portfolio companies and why you invested in them. Yeah, so, so I was- This I is was, a softball yeah. <laughs> right here. So I was going to talk about Solar City, um, but I can actually talk from, from the same perspective as, as our investment in Solar City, I can talk about our first investment, which was a company called Sea Power, which ended up getting acquired by Constellation Energy. Um, and, and, and sort of in both cases, it was an understanding that there was a stable regulatory environment that had created a new market opportunity to build a services company that actually connected the regulatory environment um, and, and sort of the regulatory constructs and the market opportunity to end consumers. In the case of Solar City, the end consumer is sort of the residential um, homeowner that wants to have solar on the roof. In the case of Sea Power, it was access to demand response and energy, serv uh, and energy efficiency services for commercial and industrial customers. Um, and in both cases, it was sort of an, our understanding of what the market factors were that had created a stable new environment um, where you can create a managed service company to connect them to the end customers. And the only reason that both of these companies were successful is that they were consumer centric. They understood what the customers wanted and how to deliver them and connect them back up into these new market constructs versus the other way around of actually being sort of technology centric or market centric. Um, and that, that was sort of the, the, I think the critical success in, in both those companies. And that, that's in common with Solar City to a certain, like you mentioned, it's, it's to a certain extent. It's a, it's a channel customer acquisition. Yeah. Play. It has nothing to do with. It's it's all about yeah, transparent delivering conductive it, oxides. Or, exactly right? right. So it's all about delivering a, um, a a product or a service that the end customer eventually wants. In the case of Solar City, their their big inflection point around growth was actually around the the stable ITC or investment tax credit that that enabled uh, them to offer sort of low cost or, or zero upfront cost solar. In the case of Sea Power, it was this shift and trend towards the electricity markets offering demand, uh, demand response markets and demand response services. Good, good. Uh, Dave, tell us uh, one, about one of your portfolio companies, you, one of your proud, your proud parent of. I'm gonna talk about one of, uh, actually our latest uh, uh, investment, um, which would be with um, a company called Yertle, Y-E-R-D-L-E. -E. Um, why we invested in them, well, first and foremost was team. It was, it was a young yet really uh, accomplished team, the, the uh, former chief sustainability officer at Walmart and the youngest president of the, of the Sierra Club, and then the team they put behind them to actually create um, a shared economy collaborative consumption model whereby the platform enables people, uh, in particular friends, to share things that they have in their garage, in their house, what have you, and um, it, it that model is consistent with the trend that we're seeing out there, which is the younger generation doesn't want to own anything anymore. They just want to share or borrow. Um, and so we think that the platform that they put together is really is, has a good shot at actually going viral here in the not so, di so distant future, and, it, and it's meeting a need. Um, and at the same time, by meeting that need, what I like most about it is that it addresses resource constraints by you know, enabling people to actually consume less and to share more. You're uh, reducing the use of dirty energy, promoting the use of clean energy, reducing uh, you know, resource constraints in some way, shape, or form. Okay, all right. I, I have to bother you, uh, Dave, just for one quick question question because you, you, you call yourself a venture design studio. You know, typically I want to get money from Pedram. I bring him a PowerPoint. I lie to him for about an hour, right? I tell him that I'm going to be at $5 billion in two years, right? In three years we're going to go public or get acquired. Um, and uh, he gives me money and uh, I see him once a month at a, at a board meeting occasionally, yeah. occasionally, but he's a good VC. He helps me uh, yeah. build my company. Um, What's the process? Uh, so who do I have to lie to at your company, and do you give me money? So um, what's interesting is that typically you'll come to me, I'll find out about your company through Pedram or Sean 
or some other venture cap. That is our that is our channel for finding opportunities. And why they introduce us to those opportunities is because um, they bring the money, um, and we bring the services that they can't provide. While we have invested in in cash, seventeen companies as of late, um, that's not why companies are coming to us. They're coming to us for UX. They're coming to us for brand strategy and business model strategy. And these guys are coming to us because they can't provide those services. Okay, so if the VC has some confidence in your, capa in your capabilities, they essentially outsource some of the company structuring to you. Is that, is that a terribly, is that the wrong way to put it? But They're coming to us to help us help their portfolio, or which will soon be our portfolio, reimagine uh, their business. Okay, all right. So it's a, it's a very different model than what's been done yeah, so far. Yeah, no one's doing this Kay. right now. All right. And I re Sean? I reimagine all the time. <laughs> Sean, don't, don't touch him, please. Don't touch him. Um, Sean, tell us about a company in, in your portfolio. Uh, I've got a company in my portfolio called Lumigro. Um, it's kind of a both an ag play. Well, it's, it, it plays off of ag and, but it's an LED company. It's LEDs for greenhouses. Uh, it is kind of a poster child because it, what we look for are big, uh, we, we go out and look and see or um, decide amongst our partnership what we think big growth areas are going to be. With, you know, right away we thought solar had left the station you know, in 2006. We looked for a back end play. We had a solar racking company. Um, so instead of front end, back end. So it benefits from the overall growth of solar. It has done so. Lumigrow. That was Sunlink? Sunlink, Sunlink correct. Okay. So just the mount, mounting, mounting hardware for modules on rooftops? Correct. Yes. Non-penetrating rooftop mounts. And now they do ground mounts. But, um, but Lumigrow, so you have everybody chasing the LED market. Everybody realizes that LEDs are the future. Um, but the white light market is 100 how, I mean, how many hundreds of billions you, you, can, you can choose for yourself? But LEDs for greenhouses, which access only uh, very specific parts of the light spectrum, the reds and the blues that enhance uh, uh, yields in, 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 for growers, um, is a very small market. Uh, it's only about uh, two and a half, three billion dollars. Two and a half, three billion dollars is, is a plenty big enough market for me. And it's not very competitive. They're, they're, they were leading the league already. The guy had bootstrapped for three and a half years, had the patent, was already post revenue, but still looking for a, a, a reasonable valuation in our minds um, to get help and was extremely capital efficient. We're about to go break even in a couple months and there's only been uh, $1.25 million into the company. Uh, so well, they're, not, they're not making their own LEDs. They're packaging fixtures and selling to uh, greenhouse, greenhouses. Is that right? Correct. The patent is to design the, the, the board. And on the board, uh, you have the LED lights that we buy from a... From so a, what, are, what are marijuana growers using currently? Well, if you go on, if you, if you, if you, if you go on YouTube, you'll find that Lumigro is a very, very popular company. <laughs> you know what? You and know? It, it's not counting. I told them not to sell um, into that market, and it's it's actually we have a few sales into distributor. We're trying to legally stay <laughs> appropriate, <laughs> but with distribu distributor up anyway. It's a very small part of the All right, business. Sorry, I, YouTube, we've digressed. We've digressed. You get like ten minute videos that can be done in 30 seconds. So it's like, yeah, this is good stuff. But you are replacing incandescence or high pressure sodium or halogen flame. Fluorescence and high pressure sodium, yeah. Okay. Fluorescence and in growth chambers, which is universities and like Monsanto just put a big order in. Uh, they have a huge underground facility in St. Louis. It's, I don't know what they did. The, you know, in Monsanto, you never know. You know, they did Agent Orange and DDT, but it's, this will be good stuff. Um, but we're lighting some, some uh, projects for them. Uh, Dow AgriSciences is a, is a client. Syngenta is a client. The, the top grower of the year for North America, Rainbow, up in uh, BC, Canada, is, is, is a client. Uh, big names. OK. <laughs> Uh, doesn't go in the vice fund. You know, there are vice fund <laughs> portfolios, also, right? Uh, yeah, uh, if you like. I okay, mean, I, I understand. I'm not big on classifications, you know, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to sell a product. I, you know, that's the bottom line. You know, you got to, 
a company, venture capital is very, very easy, and you're ha you have a twist on it now, and I think it's a great twist. But it's you're buying equity, and there's a lot of different you know structural formats you can go through to do that. But at the end of the day, the company needs to sell a product. You know, it's it's very basic, and it, it, you've got to just drill into ha you know how how defensible is. Well, I won't go through the whole screen. Okay. All right. Good. You know, um, we, I just ran into a venture capitalist who won't mention his name. He works for a reputable, large brand name. Um, and they no longer have a green tech practice. It used to be that they put one third of their money into green tech companies. They no longer put any new money into, their, into, into green tech, unless you can sort of call it a green IT. Play. If you can throw green into some other vertical, they can they can say, okay, we'll invest in that. But that's a company with 70. That's a firm with 70 green tech investments. They've invested. They have 70 portfolio companies in green tech, and they are running as fast as they can away from that rubric. Um, Pedram, is this? Uh, are we going to see a lot more? I mean, you know, we we joked it was it was not that easy to populate. This, this panel because nobody owns up to being a green tech investor anymore. Um, is, do, do, is this a, have you, do you have any pattern recognition that you, you've, you've seen something like this before where, where this will rebound? Or, or are we stuck in a, a green tech VC asset class of half a billion dollars a year for the rest of uh, no, our, I think, I think our the, lives? The, the pendulum's swung pretty far the other way. You know, as as, uh, as as rosy colored as everything was, I think five years ago, where you know it doesn't matter what you do or how much capital you needed, you'd get funded. Um, we, we are sort of in, in that lull right now, where there's not a lot of traditional firms that are chasing new deals, um, and that's absolutely true. But but I think that what's going to happen is is it's better for you, right? There's more deals. It's lower valuations, right? Well, the, there's less there is. Uh, but on the flip side, the, the the concern now, the big concern right now, which which has actually been for about three or four years, is is follow-on financing. So even if we come in with the first check, are, are we going to be stuck funding the entire um, progress and development of the company going forward? So I think what's going to start happening, though, is, is I don't think that there's going to be a reemergence of a lot of, of traditional VCs coming back into the sector like they did before. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what's going to happen is there are companies like Nest, right, where they are true consumers, uh, consumer product companies that, that do offer an energy um, solution in, in a grand scheme of things, but they kind of do look like traditional venture plays at the same time. So I think those types of companies are, are absolutely going to get um, funded by, by the traditional VCs. And I think the, uh, the, a lot more of the science-oriented companies are, are going to get funded by a new crop of um, emerging early-stage venture capital firms, right? The, the things that, um, you, you know, next-gen firms that we just haven't seen yet. And I think that model is going to, uh, to, to serve itself. Um, and, and we see that in the same thing with, with IT. I mean, we we're talking about some of these new smaller funds, right? Right-sized funds, mm -hmm. where even if you do get a, a you know a single or a double, it's still pretty good for the fund. So, in other words, if uh, they sell a company for thirty million dollars and they have a hundred million dollar fund, they're they're sitting pretty, right? Sure. Whereas you sell a thirty <laughs> company for thirty million dollars, it doesn't move the needle, right? Yeah, we we call that a you know wasted shot, right? It's it's a Wasted bullet. Yeah. And that's too bad because 95% of all exits are at $100 million valuation or less. Yep. Okay. That's where the big opportunity is right now. Right. And that's why I think there's going to be a lot of new fund managers that are going to have sort of that type of appetite with, with the ability to actually get LPs in these quote unquote right sized funds that could get in there and take advantage of exactly what Dave's talking about. So the hot, the hot trend right now from what, I, what I'm hearing in terms of limited partner interest is with funds that are 35 to 75 million focused on seed. And um, growth funds that are 400 million or, or more. The, the hard to raise funds are in the range of 150 to 300. And, and that going mid, at early stage. stage. So not the early stage, but that late stage financing that you yep. just. Well, so you're saying that late stage that Petra mentioned is easier to get than that round. What I'm B, talking about growth. B? Yeah, I'm talking about growth. So mezzanine and, and beyond. Yeah. That's that's where but we're seeing the, funds easier to raise. Yeah, I'll jump in on the on the on the fund on the second round. So I mean, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's the flight flight to to wherever, um, but uh, strategics are coming in big time. I mean, we have exactly. we have big corporate venture arms all over us for Series B rounds and beyond. 
Uh, You're saying as limited partners or as co co investors in in the in in with the, in your portfolio as a, as a as a as a funding and a co investor a funding investor for the next round. Okay, but um, uh, they're a very important part of the whole ecosystem, and it's you know it's a little bit if you get one then well. There's, if you have one strategic investor, if they don't eventually buy you, then it's going to be hard to sell it to another strategic, you know, somebody in the space because they say, well, you knew a lot more about that company than I'm ever going to know, and you didn't want it, so why would I want it kind of thing. So you need to get a couple of strategics involved, I think. So is there the typical venture fund in its platonic Ideal is a ten-year partnership. Is that is that right? It's typically a ten-year partnership, and then it's dissolved, or it 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 it, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't exist. No, it goes on. Um, but you're no longer investing from from that from that. You're no fund. longer investing after you should, I mean, if you're talking about a typical generic fund, you're no longer investing uh, in de novo investments after five years. Okay. After that but, point, but it's my following. point is is that if you had a cure for cancer and it was going to take fifteen years to get to market, you'd have to pass on that deal. Uh, yes, you're passing on the cure for cancer. <laughs> I'm not passing on cancer uh, saving. I, I um, saying that it's not my field, but if you know that it cures cancer, it, the valuation is probably a little over my head. Okay, all right. That's, <laughs> it's not exactly what I wanted to, to, to pull out of you. Um, are there, is there room within the venture capital world to change the model a little bit? If materials plays take more than 10 years, well then why, doesn't your, why don't your LPs give you 15 years? If, um, are there changes in the covenants that you deal with in your LPs that might, make, that, that might not close out a generation of, 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 of new energy entrepreneurs? Well, I think, you know, when, when you're saying it's a 15-year timeline, this is a very weird hypothetical construct because the average uh, uh, um, uh, the average age of a fund is, I think, right now, 15 or 16 years because you add on extra years after the 10-year uh, because there are tailors, there are uh, portfolio companies that are still alive, still have promise, but have not, and LPs don't want to be allocated individual shares in these companies, and then they have to deal with what they're paying us to do. So they keep on renewing um, and pay us to take care of those, those companies. So it's a weird construct that you're throwing out there. But that being said, can, can, I mean, the LPGP relationship is a very complex one that changes in cycles. And right now, they nailed it, nailed it. I mean, I'm in the market. I've got $50 million on the cover of my PPM. Um, they're looking for micro VC, rifle shot, capital efficient, people that know the space and have been in the space. Uh, they're not looking to fund the, the, the old norm, which is the $250 million, go take a, take a couple of shots at the market and make sure you can invest at least $20 million in each, in each company. Because that's, that's, that is, that's a, a hindrance to growth. You know, when you say, I have to be able to deploy you know, the 20 to $30 million in a company in order to make it worth my while, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Um, I mean, we look at trade sales and, and we look at valuations that are low enough that we can get out at a nice, you know, cash on cash return um, without having to go over your $100 million number that you, you quoted. Um, and it's a model that is, it works screamingly well so far. Okay. Sounds like a good job. Um, Dave, I, I'm still, I, I want you to dial, dig down a little into the design and mm -hmm. give me an example yeah. of you know, I, you have a dozen portfolio companies, yep. more or less. T give me a before and, and don't use people power, but give me a, a, a before and after example. You know, let me give you an example of, of, of a brand that I think will resonate with everyone here um, relative to what design can do and, and what I mean by reimagination. Um, let's, think about, let's think about Nest. So you've got, you've got before Nest, 100 plus different uh, thermostat companies out there. Not sexy, who cares? And then along comes Nest. And from a user experience perspective, it's completely reimagined. As a matter of fact, last night, except my wife is in Tahoe right now. Last night I get home, we live in Napa, 
I crank the AC to 66. I get a phone call from her because she's on her phone and can see what I just did um, in terms of the thermostat. She's like, why do you have it at 66? Talk about a reimagination of user experience. <laughs> like that, that's creepy but wild, right? Is that a good thing? Yeah. From a brand perspective, I mean, think about it. You walk into a lot of some of my friends. You walk into their house, and they literally think that Nest is sexy. It's the first thing they want to show. Hey, look what sure. I got! They have like a little a, yeah. a chair sit, sitting, looking at the thermostat. Yes, right? and then from a business model perspective, they're doing fifty, sixty thousand month units a month right now. So how many? How many? Fifty to sixty thousand. It's it, it, it's 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 unreal from a user experience, brand, and business model perspective. What what design can do and design thinking can do with regards to reimagining the way in which something works and is done and sold. Okay, um, but I asked you to give me an example from a company in your portfolio. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So so uh, Scoot, it took uh, it took it, it reimagined the way in which people commute through the city and um, basically is now like zip car for electric scooters. And so now in in San Francisco. Um, there are scooters all over the city where people are taking, locating the scooter with their phone, using that phone um, as their key, and they're they're running errands. They're taking you know a scooter for the weekend and traveling around the city, and they're reimagining the way in which people actually um, uh, you know commute through the move, city. Move, yeah, sure. all through who, design. Who are, who are the customers? Who, is it is it really young people? Is it or is it a, a more varied? It, it's kind of it's, it's it's twofold. One, it's the it's the it's the it's the tech. Kind of crowd that um, you know want to go down from their office building and and, 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 and grab a scooter and go run an errand, um, and it's also uh, you know the the weekend visitor that comes in and instead of uh, you know taking the bus or a taxi or something like that, uh, hops on the electric scooter and sure. goes around sure. to, goes around town. All right, Pedro. And, and this is a great theme actually. I just wanted to touch on that. I mean, the, the reimagining existing industries doesn't necessarily have to be done through technology. I mean, we're investors in a company called Lyft. Um, which is uh, doing the exact same thing, right? It's just re reimagining public transportation through ride sharing. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen the, their little pink mustaches up in San Francisco. It's, 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 it's the entire experience is, is trying to, to change, make it a better, cheaper experience than just get jumping into a cab. And I totally see all the pink mustaches, but I have no idea what's going on behind Yeah, the just download mustaches. the app and get a ride. Okay. <laughs> You so every every car with that mustache is is, is, a, is, a, a, lift, is a, yeah, a participant a, a participant in that, That's in that right. program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you get a fist pump too, right? That's right. Yeah. No, I know. Um, Pedram, let's we're talking in general. Let's talk about utilities just for a second, okay? Just a little bit. Um, You've thought about reimagining the utility a little bit. We've had a lot of conversations in this, so let's just keep it clean. But um, <laughs> what what do you? What, what, what do you, you, you reimagine the utility uh, organization for me? Solar City. If you great, think about it. Great, one word answer. I love that. Uh, and, and in fact, they call themselves utility, Lyndon Rive calls himself utility 2.0. And so that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful example, I think, right? The distributed generation. Yep. Um, and they're not just Solar City, they're energy storage company as well as energy efficiency recently announced. So they're a real threat to. Um, utilities, right? Yeah, and a potential partner as well, right? It's, it's delivering the That's types of services. That's what you say when you're a threat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Steal my thunder. Um, so, give me a, a different. A, 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 so, Solar City. That's an easy answer. What, what do you think? If you were going to invest in something that approached, that looked at pricing or electricity mm -hmm. or delivering electricity, yeah. what, do, what do you see as as yeah, we actually spent a long time thinking about that, and uh, and, and we started by, by looking at the uh, the retail markets down in Texas, um, and also in the PJM market as being interesting areas that you could reimagine what a retail business would look like if you were just an energy service provider, um, and and there's a lot of different ways of thinking about it. I mean, those guys are just basically competing by having you know fancier billboards, and that's that's about it, right? There's really You're no talking fundamental about the, in, in the, the energy retail in the ERCOT territory. This exactly. People yeah, and there's like buying for each other's business. Last right? I checked, there's like 39 of them that you can go choose from, and they're all fundamentally offering the same thing. Some with a free thermostat, some not. Um, but but it's it's a little bit on price, but it's not really being super creative about the types of things that people want. And so what we're actually starting to see is that that the uh, the entertainment um, and the communications companies are now starting to, to tread in this territory as well. You know, companies like Comcast and companies like AT and T are now realizing that it's not all that difficult to be a full service provider because energy from their perspective is a, is a commodity that they can just, as long as you own the customer experience through things like Nest, 
then you can sort of get a wholesaler or a wholesale provider to provide everything else that you need in terms of the infrastructure on the back end for energy. So, so I think that, that's, that's the way that I think the, the future is going to go, is going to be more of these bundled package solutions that aren't just electrons flowing, but, but a lot more services packaged into them. Mm -hmm. I was at um, it's the Edison, Edison Electric International meeting, does that sound right? It was a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco, and it's where a thousand um, executives from uh, IOUs, from investor-owned utilities, descend. And uh, if you're interested in what utilities really feel, you need to go to that event, because when they come to green tech events, they're on best behavior and they kiss butt, right? Um, but when they're in amongst a thousand of their own folks, they, they let their hair, what little there is of it, down. And they talk about the threat to their basic existence that renewables pose. And you could hear a little bit of renewables actually are big enough now to be bothering them a little bit. And there, 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 there's going to be some showdowns, maybe good spirited, bad spirited, but there's going to be some interesting um, adversarial events coming up between renewables and, 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 and the large utilities, I think. Sorry, that was a, diver uh, that was a digression. Uh, Sean, you, you have a couple of water companies in your portfolio, which is somewhat unusual. Um, especially that you have a few in, in not that enormous a portfolio. And the, the, the VC lore is that you can't make money in water. Uh, we just sold one for three, three times our money. Okay, so much for VC lore. Um, uh, the, the other one is, uh, is uh, electric deionization, which is the next uh, rev on purification. And VC lore also has it that these take uh, the, that, uh, there's a time mismatch when you're dealing with water because you're always selling to muni municipal water sources. Uh, we're actually selling to residential. I mean, it was a, it's, 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 a, it's a technology that the CEO founded uh, or, or has 50 patents when he was at Siemens. He was, uh, and they had, they, well, actually just are in the process of selling it off, but it was a $300 million a year business in the municipality space. We took it and are applying it to resident, uh, residential and, because it's just shrinking it down, making the technology much smaller. And uh, restaurants, you know, um, small businesses, apartments, uh, apartment buildings, I should say. Um, I mean, water, water is, is, is it's 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 the ocean. I mean, it's scary. It's got a lot of power, there, and we don't have enough fresh water. And you know, whoever comes up with the low energy desal idea is going to be, you know, on in the Force 400 right away. Um, but at the end of the day, people there haven't been many, many good ideas. We specifically look for water because we have a, a partner who knows water very well, um, and have. Um, you know, you say we funded two out of our nine portfolio companies. Uh, that that is a big percentage, mm -hmm. but we, I mean, compared to what we've seen, it, we we've been very, very, very targeted. Um, All right. So, so how is deal flow these days, Petrim? Are you are, are you still beating the bushes? You still talking to entrepreneurs every day? You're yeah, still we're looking at a, a, comp a you know, we're, company. We're we're absolutely like I said. We we're we're as active as we've ever been. I mean, our our thesis hasn't changed from from day one, and and we're still we're still looking. Um, but it just really has to do with with the uh, the same types of filters that we have on any other deal. So so we don't have an allocation specifically for energy. Um, you know, but I think that you know when allocation the deals come, for good deals, right? That's it. That's it. One hundred percent allocation on good deals is what we're what we're, uh, what we're gunning for. Um, if if you know the right team, like for example the the team Yertle that that Dave was mentioning comes in with a disruptive idea, that's fantastic. So we'll do those all day long. Okay. And, and the action, the level of activity that you're seeing? I mean, are, Dave, are you? Are lots, you? lots. Uh, you know, because we're, we're typically on the IT side, and, and what has happened over you know, the past, call it four or five years, but in particular over since 1995, is that the cost to actually start a startup has gone down. In fact, it is 99% cheaper, costs you 99% less to actually start a company today than it did in 1995. And, and so what that uh, turns into is more and more startups actually um, coming about. So you're looking at more and more opportunities, more good, more, more bad, but at the end of the day, more and more companies. But, uh, okay, but is uh, Sean or anyone, if, if someone comes in with that capital intensive play, you tell them to find another, uh, someone who can afford the round C and the round D? All, that? I, I do that all the time. You, you do that all the time. Say no, right? 
But you because say, of capital intensity. Okay. Okay. And so it's not our game. I mean, it's it's. Uh, if there's a that's factor, that's if there's a game. factory in the future, <laughs> if there's a factory in the future, it's not part of your program. Uh, no, I mean, the, <laughs> we've got a company that actually just bought a factory, so it <laughs> puts me in a little bit of a spot here. But it's also a segment where, that nobody would nobody would fund this woman. Um, she'd gone to at least a hundred different places, and she walked to my door, and I, I we funded her. We led the first round. And uh, they're going to be in the news soon. It's a, a segment that wasn't, I mean, it's in the ag space, basically, and a segment that wasn't even identified as a, under the clean tech umbrella before uh, at the time of investment. And it's become very, very successful. Okay. And they own a factory. But, you know, that's not, that, was, that wasn't what I was thinking going into it. I just uh, think, I mean, one thing you can count on for sure is that things will change. I mean, that's why you, you overweight management in an investment decision is because there will be pivots, there will be changes. I mean, without question, 100% of the time, nothing goes perfectly. I mean, that's why projections are just kind of a, it's like a consulting interview, you know, case study. It's like, they, we wanna see how you're thinking about it rather than what the actual numbers are. Well, the, the Google interview has turned out to be a load of garbage, right? If they ask you how many ping pong balls yep. you can fit in the Empire State Building, it proves nothing even if you get the answer correct. Why, um, why aren't manhole covers square? Why are manhole covers square? Why aren't they? Why aren't they square? Why, why, are, they, why are they round? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you I don't, get a, job, you don't get a job at Microsoft. Yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> Petrum, same for you. Um, somebody comes in and says, and this is a little tricky, right? Somebody comes in and says they have a thin film cadmium telluride <laughs> uh, solar play for you named Real Solar. Um, <laughs> what do you do? What, what, how did you end up with that against your thesis? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Team, honestly. Okay. It, it was, yeah. So, so we, were, uh, we, we were enamored with the team and, and their ability to not necessarily want to create um, an end product company, but a tools company. And that's exactly what they'd done before. They're, they're ex-KLA 10 car guys. Uh, it's one of my portfolio companies actually uh, with the technology of super low cost um, solar manufacturing, which they don't want to do in-house. They actually are a licensing model um, with the projections to get down to 30 cents a watt um, out of their first run. And that's what we're kind of gunning for, helping, helping okay. them position. So it's, it's, not, it's not somebody who's going to come back and say, we need to build a half a billion dollar factory no, because that's, that's uh, you know, Sean mentioned strategics, that's exactly what we're looking for right now, right? Is, is that the, the Series B, Series C is no longer going up and down Sand Hill Road. It's actually going and finding folks, um, you know, in Russia and China. In Asia, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Everywhere yeah. there. So, you know, the, the title of this panel is Investment Trends in Energy, and it's, it's, it's too enormous a, a scope to talk about. You could mm -hmm. narrow it down to just water or uh, ride sharing or the sharing economy or cadmium telluride. So it's, it's, it does a little bit of a disservice because we can't cover what we want to. And we, well, it does a service because we can skip over and talk about anything we want, which is what we did. Um, we have 10 minutes. Um, you have three venture capitalists who are open for business. <laughs> Please oh. feel free to, p Rich Hilt, right there. Um, my, na my name is Rich Hilt. And I'm unaffiliated, um, just like Groucho Marx. Any affiliation that I would have would not be. You wouldn't belong to any club that would um, have you as a member. There's a whole bunch of pieces to the venture capital business. The, the piece that got attracted like a moth to the flame was the IT high tech part. Um, if you look at the medical devices pharma part of VC, it, it seems to be more comfortable with the longer term from developing a product, the larger investments requirements. What is it about the IT part? Is it simply the larger narcissism within that sector um, that, that drew them to clean tech as opposed to drawing the med tech people to clean tech? So it's, it's funny because Eric and I were actually talking about this exact same thing. If you think about the, the med tech side of things, it's, uh, it's, it's capital intensive, it's, it's very, very long time cycles, time, time frames, it's highly Regul regulated. Regulated. It's highly regulated. It's highly regulated. There, there, there's a lot of things that, that you could say are, are similar, except for one fundamental difference, which are um, patents and your ability to actually extract um, high economic rent from your end product. So the, the issue that I have, for example, and I'll just 
you know, I'll, I'll sort of bash my own per, you know, portfolio company for a second, the, my, my real solar guys, at the end of the day, they're producing electrons. And there's no way for them to say, because of the way that I produce my electrons, I'm going to charge you 50x what PG&E charges you. Um, whereas if I do have a drug that prolongs life for an initial three and a half years for a cancer patient, I can virtually name my own price. So that's the fundamental difference, right? And I think that, that the, the, uh, the med tech folks are smart enough to realize that, that they don't have that advantage in the, in the commodity industry um, where you have to compete with coal and you have to compete with existing water technologies, or whatever the case might be, right? So, so it's the ability to extract that economic rent is, I think, the fundamental difference between the two. And so from, from an IT perspective, and then the second part of that is that a lot of the technologies that we saw um, on, the, on the solar side really were around semiconductors initially. And so that was a more natural fit because it was semiconductor processes, semiconductor components, and what have you. So I think for, for those two reasons alone is, I think, where people shifted that way. Sir. Yeah, John Mashey, Techvisor. Uh, so in thinking about the ups and downs in clean tech investment, uh, could you maybe partition that into the what's particular to clean tech and what's particular to the thing we've seen in VC investments over the years where you know there were investments in 30 disk drive companies, all of whom were going to have 50% of the market, and then there were a pile of investments in mini supercomputer makers, blah, blah, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So how, how much do you think this is of the, here's a bunch of new ideas, a whole lot of companies start, a lot of investments go, and now it takes a while to sort things out until the sort of next things come along. So how much is similar to that and what's different? You want to take a crack at this one first? Sure. Um, I think what happened is the, the, the term clean tech got coined. You know, it, 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 legacy, on a legacy basis, it's always, there's always been clean tech. I mean, it's been waste management, it's been environmental tech, all these different things. But what happened was 2005, you know, Element went out, DFJ Element went out, put 150, uh, 150 million on a, on a cover and came home with $282 million. And the place, you know, the, everyone went, went crazy. Cash flows, it's very interesting, it's, it's very, uh, feel good, you know, there's a lot of SRI, you know, social responsibility. Um, everybody's talking about the double bottom line at that point in time. So a lot of money flowed into the sector. Everybody wanted to get into it. Uh, a lot of quick, poor decisions were made. A lot of, I mean, it, 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 like, like you said quite well, I think it takes sorting out. And I think the, the, and the, and the press has a lot of blame too, because you know I've heard about a, a clean tech bubble. Okay, clean tech is going to be going for the next hundred years at least. I mean, energy is just too big of a segment on its own. Besides anything else in clean tech, water or efficiency or anything like that, energy on its own is is such a huge global industry that you cannot not try to invest in new technologies and new delivery mechanisms and new everything new in that sector. Um, so what happened is it, it, it's a very, very broad umbrella, and some people started doing Me Too investing in the first, you know, with the biofuels and the, and the front end solar, and then people got smarter, and, but there was, the, the failures were so public and so unfair. I mean, Solyndra. Oh, we, we were not gonna bring that up. Solyndra was unfair, okay, because it was a good technology with too too much money in and but too, too too long of a timeline didn't anticipate silicon coming down and um but the press that that got compared to the dollars invested in a lot and in smart ideas was ridiculous and really pushed uh, public opinion i think that's why a lot of these uh generalist funds that played in clean tech because they it, it's a vc is a business you know we have our clients our clients are lps so and their LPs are starting they're reading the paper going, Solyndra, what a huge F up, you know. Why, why, are you, why did you invest, in, no, even, why, you know, why are you even in that space, get out. And so they dictate to these, these and, 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 and the, the generalist funds that have LPs that are angry about it, don't want those LPs angry because they're gonna be, keep raising funds, right. But people that are dedicated to the sector are, are going to roll with the waves mm -hmm. and let it come. Um, wave technology is going to come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's take another question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Dan Miller with the Rotor Group or Clean Tech Seed Stage Venture Capital. 
Um, following up, actually, on that discussion, so one of the major drivers of clean tech that's actually not even been mentioned is uh, climate change. We're, you know, there's a huge problem. Uh, and when Congress didn't pass the energy bill, everyone said, well, I guess climate change was a passing fad. And even though I kind of wish it was a passing fad, it's not. And so I'd like your comments on how the uh, current and coming impacts and more attention and knowledge of the problems facing us and the need to address them are going to change the current situation in clean tech investing. I, I, I'd like to start, but jump in at any point. Just jump in. You know, uh, VC is a business, like I just said, and you need money to be able to fund solutions to the problems of global warming and to help our Earth uh, live. So uh, that's why you, we haven't heard it yet, because uh, the, I mean, you, your fund has to make money to raise more money to be able to address more problems. At the end of the day, I chose clean tech because of what you're talking about, because I, I, I feel that uh, our environment's uh, in peril. And I have young daughters, and I want them. I'm, I'm not going to cry like a Ted with uh, John Tour, but but I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I'm I'm very very much a true believer. I'm a, I'm a I'm one of the target markets for a lot of companies that come in that we say no to because their only market is true believers. I'm that guy. I'll pay a little bit more to have something green, uh, but that's not a good business. Uh, but that uh, that's just a start. So Dave, do your do your startups care about global warming? And can the, well, yeah. I mean, that's it's it's one of the I, reasons. I know that's not what you ask, but. Close enough. Well, you know, we, we started Green Start under the premise that, that, that climate change was the single defining challenge of our generation. And if you're going to help solve that problem, you needed entrepreneurs and innovation to do that. And then, and then how do you do that? Well, you find good entrepreneurs and you, you help them. And, and the good news is, is that we see good entrepreneurs getting into the sector not only to make money, but to, 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 to help solve this problem. And they're actually figuring out, they're inspired by actually solving a problem that is climate change and making money from it. So we see a whole new trend of, of, of young, smart, motivated, um, and, and impassioned people coming in to solve this problem. So Petra, yeah. a company comes to you and says, there's gonna be cap and trade legislation in the next four years, and we have a software program that will do will ease some aspect of carbon trading, whether it's uh, arbitrage or, or just... I funded that company. Okay. <laughs> it's zero. What's the name of the company? Carbon Flow. Carbon Flow. Oh, uh, Neil Dykeman? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. That answer, he answered your question Yeah, you. so, so actually, I just wanted to... <laughs> It, it's, uh, I, I love actually audience questions because they end up kind of going together really well. So, so the, the climate change issues actually goes back to the previous question, um, you know, these, these different cycles. I think the, car, the climate change issue was the catalyst that actually created a lot of the interest that we saw in, in the first wave of investments, right? I think that that was the, the number one thing, if I had to point that one thing, right? You say, ah, oh, oil prices, blah, blah, blah. But I think really it was, it was the first time that, that all of these things came together, which, which created a quasi-inflection point for people to get interested and start investing. Um, and it's not gonna go away, right? But I think it's kind of served its purpose that now the general awareness is there and there's a lot of people like, like Dave is saying um, that, that do want to continue to add to this. I think the, the one thing that I would point to, which has really nothing to do with energy, is, uh, is education. I think education is a similar sector that's going to get disrupted and it's going to get a lot of interest much like the, uh, the world of energy and clean tech did about five, six years ago because of the, the technological disruption that we're seeing in the world of education and how that, you know, the, like the iPad, for example, can change the way that teachers and, and students interact. So, so there's, there's always something that needs to happen before you end up with, with these types of cycles and I think carbon ch uh, climate change definitely serves its purpose. Ripu? Uh, from SRI International. Following up on the question that uh, you asked, Dan, yeah. um, seems to me there, you know, there has to be clarity of purpose. I mean, I'm hearing on the one hand, clarity of purpose. So if the fund is there really to make money, I see plenty of opportunities because the, this industry is so huge, several trillion dollars, so getting a piece of the action can make certainly some investors very, very rich. But does it move the needle on the climate change is the question. And if I look at what has happened, the only thing that Allah has changed to any significant amount to bring down the CO2 emissions has been the switching from coal to natural gas. Oh, and, about and, an, and an economic downturn, that helped as well. <laughs> no, 
No, I can tell you that it was not just economic downturn. If I factor that out and look at only the emissions from electricity production in the US, because if I look at the how many terawatt hours, and we can talk that separately offline. Yes, we're but, gonna... but you, you, can, you can factor that out also. Despite that, if you look at the tonnage of CO2 abated, um, you'll see that that's where it's happening. So, so uh, we probably, in the 30 seconds we have here, we're probably not going to be able to address this, but are you saying that, natu you're saying that natural gas has made some fundamental changes in our carbon footprint? My question was about, is the VC, should the public be looking to the VC? Should the public be looking to the VC? The answer is no. <laughs> I don't know. You don't even have to finish that sentence. Whether, whether, that, oh. <laughs> whether or not they do, uh, we are trying to address you know, the underlying issues. I mean, I think if you look at energy efficiency, there's no, nothing better uh, than taking a load off the grid, right? Yeah. And there are, I mean, there's an extreme example. I mean, if you want to look at a micro case study, uh, and not micro, it's a, it's a big country, Japan with their nuclear you know, disaster and what they've tried to do uh, as a government. And, and they have big plans. And it's a lot of energy they're taking off the grid. And that will lower emissions. Yeah, energy efficiency in general, especially with commercial buildings. And then you talked really quickly about, um, well, I wanted to talk about leakage. Because, you, yeah, you, I think that um, leakage as it relates to, um, God, I should have. Uh, that's, yes, exactly. That it, it could solve it, but but methane leakage is, is another problem that that, that that results by using this technology. And so, what do you do? There was just a hundred twenty-eight million dollar investment in a company called Skyonic to do CCS carbon capture and sequestration to turn it into baking soda. If the science is actually real, I'm not quite sure. I think we have one more question. $128 million, it better be real. It's not a guarantee. Nope, that's it. That's it. Thanks to our panel. All right. Sean, Pedram, Dave, thank you guys.